I've started the um, I've started the recording, and there's already 28 people in the room, and I'm sure people will be slowly um, joining us over the course of the evening and joining and, and departing as as and how they see fit. Um, the idea is to have to have an informal conversation and to uh, and, to, uh, and to share thoughts and, and reflections about the topic we'll be discussing. So, um, just as sort of a note to the audience, as in, as and when you if you think of a question or if you think of a reflection or if you have a thought that you'd like to introduce even before the discussion has opened up to the audience then feel free to write it in the chat uh, so that you don't um, forget uh, and because the kind of Q&A will be on a first come first serve basis. Um, anyway my name is uh, Michal Muravsky and uh, I am your, your host for this evening. Um, I'm a lecturer in critical area studies at CIS at the School of Stephonic East European Studies at uh, University College London, and I'm also the, um, the convener of the seminar series, uh, which uh, goes by the name PPD, Perverting the Power Vertical, Politics and Aesthetics in the Global East. Um, this is PPD number 20, so this is kind of the more or less, depending on how you count, the 20th event we're, uh, we've organized, and it's our first event of the 2021-2022 um, academic year. Uh, and it's our final online event for now. Our next events, our next couple of events will be will be in real life, unless there's some sort of epidemiological explosion and we are all forced back into our computers. Uh, we shall see. Anyway, thanks very much to everyone who, uh, for joining us, um, and thanks especially to our uh, to our guest today, uh, to, to Yuri Avakumov and to Anna Bokov. And we are here today, as you will know, in order to um, in order to conduct the London launch of uh, Yuri's book, um, Paper Architecture and Anthology, which is an extraordinary achievement. It's the first. Um, it's the first kind of systematic large scale. Uh, there have been exhibition catalogues devoted to paper architecture, the phenomenon of the uh, this sort of unofficial phenomenon of the late 70s and 1980s uh, Soviet architecture scene, but there has never been a kind of um, a systematic compendium of this kind before. So uh, I'm not going to say very much. I'll just introduce Yuri now and I'll introduce Anya, who will be our guest um, later on in this series PPV 23, I think, will be an event in which Anya will have, will have the starring role. Uh, but I'll introduce Yuri as the as the speaker and Anya as the commenter. Um, uh, the plan is that we'll, uh, Yuri will speak for about half an hour, Anya will do comments for 10 minutes or so, and then we'll open the floor up to the, to the audience. But as I mentioned, if you do have any thoughts, if you have any inspiration, inspirations, or if you have any uh, things that come into your mind in the meantime, then feel free to, uh, to write them in the chat. The chat should be available to, for everybody to, uh, to use. So to introduce, um, to introduce Yuri, uh, Yuri Avakumov is an architect, artist, and curator. He graduated from the Moscow Architectural Institute Marhi in 1981 um, and has participated in, in uh, arts and architecture exhibitions since 1982. In 1984, Yuri Avakumov coined the term paper architecture to signify a genre of conceptual architectural design in the USSR in the 1980s. He has curated numerous exhibitions about paper architecture in Russia and abroad, including uh, in many cities all over, all over Europe and the and US. Um, so you can find Yuri's full, uh, full biography, including more uh, details about the, the institutions in which his works are located. The institutions include the Pushkin Museum of Finance in Moscow, the uh, Saint Pompidou in Paris, and the German Architecture Museum in Frankfurt. You can find that on the PPV website. But for now, I will I will hand over to Yuri um, for for his presentation on this on this on the fantastic book that we will be discussing today. So over yeah. to you. May I? Okay. Yes. Mm, so back again. Where is share screen? Uh, share. Okay. Yeah, does it work? Yes. Um, I usually start my lectures with this uh, page of information and uh, give a couple of minutes for the auditorium to read it. 
so then I can speak about everything else uh, a part of paper architecture um, some time ago I had a talk at the architectural institute uh, where I was invited for uh, to talk with the first two grades of the architectural students. And I realized that all of them, uh, they were born in, in 21st century. And uh, when, I, when I described the 1980s, uh, they, they thought about it like about another age, another, another time and uh, it was a time of their parents and uh, I realized that I have to explain to them what was it and uh, to explain them by words how how does the iron curtain look like it's uh, it's an extremely difficult task I think uh, because it was extremely different time and extremely different uh, country and uh, I even thought uh, that I have to, in case uh, if uh, the book will be reprinted, I think that I should uh, add some sort of timeline. Uh, what happened in the 70s when we and I uh, entered uh, the Institute? Uh, I uh, started the Institute in 1974, and I think that uh, such sort of timeline might describe something more about the country and about the condition uh, where we lived at that time and uh, i even started uh, especially for you only for but not only for you but especially for you i started this timeline and uh, i'll show you how it might look like and might it might uh, give you some more imagination about uh, the time where paper architecture was born. Um, it's a kind of a my personal story as well. Uh, this is Architectural Institute. It was built in uh, 18th century. The facade was done in 19th century. It's, a, it's our club. It's a space where I spent years. And uh, even after graduating the Institute, I came back to the Institute to, to sit in the fountain uh, and to spend some time there. And I talked to my former tutors. And, and uh, so that, that was a very magnetic uh, space. This is another building of uh, Architectural Institute. It was built in 1914 by Alexander Kuznetsov. Uh, industrial uh, architect and uh, it's a beautiful industrial art nouveau uh, it was until I, I think 1975 it was the ministry of railroads or something like that and then uh, uh, and then it was given back to architectural institute because it's also a place where Futemas uh, um, based uh, here and uh, then this is the our living conditions where we live. Uh, most of the students of Architectural Institute, with such beautiful buildings, uh, they live in in this uh, kind of a, a block apartments, and uh, I I live in 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 this like five stories building. Some people live in this twelve stories building, and uh, the cow is not is not a is not a special set, uh, the cow. For example, I came to my school, it was about 20 minutes walk, uh, through the big, uh, cabbage field. Uh, so that, that was, uh, it was not so at, at the edge of Moscow, but we had uh, fields of cabbages in the south of Moscow. It was, uh, I mean, the school was very close to uh, a famous ninth quarter of uh, Novoy Cheremushki, one of the first experimental districts uh, with uh, such architecture, and uh, and then the the uh, the timeline uh, should start. Uh, 1974. This is the year when I entered the Architectural Institute, 
And this year for me was important because I didn't know that, that this event uh, took place but at that time. But they, 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 this, uh, in 1974, there was famous bulldozer exhibition. It was in, uh, in the south of Moscow, more south than I lived, uh, in Belyaev. And you see the same buildings there, same like in the previous picture, like in a, uh, if I took a picture of uh, my, let's say, native district. Uh, there was all the same uh, everywhere. Then in 1975, it was another great event uh, of a different kind. It was uh, Apollo Soyuz flight. And the Moscow was filled with uh, Apollo Soyuz uh, cigarettes. And I started smoke uh, seriously. Uh, those series was quite expensive, so not everyone could uh, afford it. Then next, uh, it was a, a movie uh, that was shown on the 1st of January, 1976. Uh, this movie uh, was seen by auditorium of 100 million people. And since uh, 76, uh, every new year, uh, first day of the new year, if, uh, this uh, film is, is shown by by uh, Soviet and now Russian TV. And the, the main events in this uh, movie happened, again, it, it's in, in 200 meters from my school. And you see almost the same buildings uh, on the on, on, uh, backwards. Uh, this is, by the way, this is very experimental complex there. Uh, and the ninth quarter of Novi Chiriomushki is in, uh, well, is nearby, just in 200 meters. Uh, same story, uh, the, the idea of the film was that uh, main character uh, being drunk, uh, moved to, from uh, Moscow to St. Petersburg and uh, on, on a street with the same name as his own street, uh, found the same building. And uh, there was, uh, of course, different people live there and he met his love there. So we, we all and most of us, uh, same thought, and most of us lived in the same conditions. That was uh, an event that really shocked me in 1977 because I uh, saw uh, works of Vladimir Tatlin for the first time. It was an exhibition at the Central House of Writers. And it was an extraordinary event because we didn't have exhibitions of Russian avant-garde at all. It was not shown in the state museums. It was not presented uh, uh, on the display of the Architectural Museum. Uh, but uh, in House of Writers, mostly because uh, it was uh, really uh, supported by, the exhibition was supported by Konstantin Simonov, uh, famous, famous uh, Soviet, artist, uh, Soviet writer. Uh, it happened there. It was purely done, but with, uh, let's say, fashionable construction for, for that time. And it was a model of uh, Tatlin's tower. And uh, this is the catalog, which was uh, also different from the catalogs that we have for, for official uh, exhibitions, for official artists. Uh, it was done by Mikhail Anix, uh, and I had this, I, I still have this catalog. So that, that really moved me uh, uh, very much. It doesn't mean that uh, all the students uh, from the Architectural Institute came to see this exhibition, just few as I remember. Uh, it doesn't mean that all the students came to see the bulldozer exhibition or the later, the exhibition at the Pavilion Culture on Badin Chai, it was in 1975, uh, just few. Uh, so those events was, uh, they were from kind of extraordinary events, but uh, I'm including it to my timeline as well. Then there was, uh, from the other field, it's a trilogy of Leonid Brezhnev, uh, three of his novels uh, about Malay Zimbla and something else. I 
forgot, but uh, at that time, everybody should read it. Everybody in school, in the Institute. And uh, there was also recorded uh, to the vinyl plates and, uh, and uh, it was every, well, as, as we call it from every iron, uh, we could uh, listen this, uh, these novels uh, by the general secretary, uh, Brezhnev. And this is the illustration that was used on, on one of the uh, uh, vinyl records uh, by, done by very official artist Nal Banjan in 75. And uh, in 75, there was also the, the uh, Tarkovsky film uh, uh, Mirror, but it was shown just in a couple of uh, movie theaters for a couple of days. And one of the movie theaters was very close to the place where I live now on Taganka. And uh, I remember that several students from Architectural Institute came to see it. And this is Stalker another of his uh, famous movies. Then in 1980, uh, it was uh, Olympic Games and you know, uh, probably know that 60 countries uh, refused to join the Olympic Games in uh, Moscow. Moscow looked like absolutely, totally empty city because all those, uh, I don't know, unwanted elements were moved uh, to 101 kilometer from Moscow. So Moscow was totally empty. Uh, only people with tickets to the, to the Olympic Games, uh, uh, they were there. Uh, was a kind of a strange uh, event, I mean, from urbanistic point of view. Uh, then in 81 happened the exhibition Moscow Paris uh, at, at the Pushkin Museum. In 1979, uh, it was first shown at, at Central Pompidou, and then it uh, came to Moscow. It was a great event because after this exhibition, uh, the avant-garde art from 10s and 20s uh, started to be shown in uh, Soviet museums. For example, the permanent display of the uh, architectural museum started in 1982. But first, uh, a lot of things were shown, uh, drawings from uh, Leonidov or Melnikov was shown in this exhibition. This is again, uh, Leonid Brezhnev uh, uh, on this photo. And, uh, here, my personal timeline uh, stopped because in 1982, there was a uh, funeral of, of uh, Mikhail Suslov, the number one ideal, uh, ideological uh, member of uh, our government. Uh, by the way, I was in this uh, funeral on, the red, on the, the red Square, and I remember it was like minus 20. And uh, there were people who obliged to go there because uh, because their offices send them uh, kind of uh, we have to do uh, as a young specialist I have to join this uh, this event and uh, since that time I started so-called uh, catafalque races so when the same year uh, Brezhnev died and then Chernenko died and Dropov died uh, all of them died. And that was the background for paper architecture. So we did know uh, contemporary art and architecture. We had like five magazines in, in our uh, library at the Institute. Domus, uh, the Japan architect, uh, Casabella, Architecture de Jardy. What else? Uh, I don't remember the fifth one. In, fifth, in five copies, uh, big thumb. One set was at the Lenin's library, one set in our library, one set at the House of Architects, uh, and, and, and a couple of more uh, ventures. Uh, so that, that was uh, a lack uh, of information, of professional information. Uh, for the art, you should go to the library of uh, foreign uh, literature. Mm, uh, and uh, we didn't speak English at all. We, what else? Uh, we didn't, 
movies, uh, foreign movies came only by Contrabanda to Soviet Union. And in this lack of everything and lack of products, food, uh, uh, everything, uh, it was like, uh, I don't know how to call it. It was not empty space. It was like, uh, how to call it. Uh, it was a uh, space with a lack of air, like something. Vacuum? <laughs> yeah, right there. And, uh, and somehow uh, in 1981, we, but we heard about the, the competitions in, uh, that uh, the Japan architect organized for, mostly for young architects. So we wanted to take part in this competition, but it was forbidden. Uh, union uh, didn't want to to take part in it because you know this is uh, this is foreign uh, uh, this is uh, Western propaganda and then and, and so on and so on and the, our uh, all the generation tried to uh, take part in these comp uh, competitions uh, and. Uh, refused to, for the union refused them to, uh, to do that. So the first uh, competition we sent uh, illegally and I was in charge of it. Uh, it was quite risky. I didn't think that it was risky only years uh, ago. I realized it was really risky, but we spent uh, the first uh, 10 projects uh, to Japan and uh, uh, one of them uh, took the first prize and uh, came to back to Moscow on the cover of the Japan Architect magazine. It was it was huge event for Moscow scene, huge. So everybody talked about that, uh, about Misha Bilov and Maxim Kritonov, who won the first prize. And, uh, and it gave us a chance to really push uh, our union uh, to take part in these competitions. And uh, since uh, 82, we started to do it officially and quite easy without, uh, without um, bureaucracy, without uh, censorship, uh, I mean, military censorship. Uh, we had only minor ideological censorship from the union. But that was easy. And then we started, and this project, by the way, is uh, surrealistic. Uh, how the surrealism came to, to Moscow. Uh, well, in Moscow bookshops, uh, there were some albums of Salvador Dali, but that, that, that's not uh, Salvador Dali influence. It's just a surrealistic uh, project, architectural project. Uh, then uh, in 1982, Brodsky, Sasha Brodsky, Ilya Utkin uh, joined the, the, the game and immediately uh, get, got uh, their first prize uh, for the competition uh, that was called Crystal Palace. And their Crystal Palace was a fake palace. Uh, it was uh, more or less Piranesia, but uh, Piranesi used to work with stone and Sasha and Ilya worked with metal and uh, iron the materials of the 19th century uh, and then uh, it, the same year is started but uh, the exhibition and the publication uh, and the Sotheby's auction happened in the year 1983 it was those house uh, competition and uh, some people were invited uh, to the exhibition some uh, some uh, known architects uh, like Jean Novel uh, and young architects uh, had to do had to go through the competition th through the contest and uh, some of us uh, appeared to be in this uh, magazine uh, together with uh, architectural stars there was also you see in the middle of the in the center of this cover there is a project of uh, of the team of uh, Vlad Kirpichov. Uh, and in 1984, uh, there was a competition again. Uh, it was a competition combined invited stars and uh, the uh, competing 
young architects and uh, amongst uh, those young architects who won the first prize uh, was Misha Filipovna Bronzova with their imaginary, uh, let's say, St. Petersburg, who changed uh, their image from the industrial modern architecture to the, well, uh, uh, sort of uh, nature-like uh, architecture of uh, uh, Mediterranean, uh, Roman, Greek, and, and, and so on. Uh, there was, uh, by the way, uh, the manifesto of uh, Misha Filipov, who at that time in 1984, uh, he proclaimed himself as the most paper architect because he, 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 he told us uh, uh, that uh, this architecture will never be uh, being built in the Soviet Union. But now uh, there are quite a lot of uh, samples of this kind of architecture. And I was also in this uh, first 10, uh, though it's very different from Filippo's architecture. This is architecture, let's say, a constructivist uh, kind, uh, very temporary architecture. But it was uh, designed on the uh, real Moscow district, uh, and uh, I actually, I, I live in uh, one of those red uh, uh, rectangles, uh, the five-story uh, building. So we both uh, have got uh, prizes in, 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 in this competition. It was also an important event for the history of paper architecture. And in 1984, uh, the main event uh, had happened. It was the exhibition at the editorial offices of for the youth magazine. Uh, usually they had uh, the exhibitions of uh, young artists uh, in, uh, in their corridors, but they invited uh, architects uh, and uh, we uh, had a group exhibition there about uh, what uh, 12 of us uh, uh, took part uh, in this uh, uh, exhibition. And by chance, I gave a name, paper architecture to this uh, uh, exhibition. And it's not my creation, paper architecture. I, I appropriated it from the, let's say 1930s. It was a strictly professional term it was rarely used. And I found only two mentioning of this uh, paper architecture in the 30s, one in a book uh, about Piranesi and the other one in, uh, in uh, sort of a letter uh, from uh, Alexander Vesnin to young architects. And uh, since then, all the exhibition had the title paper architecture that uh, at least uh, those exhibitions that uh, I curated, uh, that was the exhibition at the central, newly built central house of the artist for the International uh, Youth Festival. Uh, in those uh, panels, uh, there are works of uh, young architects from all over the country, also from Estonia. Uh, meanwhile, uh, the new, uh, let's say, um, gamers uh, joined the team of, the growing team of paper architects. Uh, in 85, it was, uh, Tatan Kuzimbaev, Andrei Ivanov, uh, Slav Aristov, uh, with this absolutely anti-utopian project. You see the uh, apartment houses uh, uh, structured uh, with the pieces of pure nature. Uh, also first, uh, first prize in, uh, in, in Japan. Then uh, a group of uh, Mitya Bush, uh, Sasha Chemikov and uh, Mitya Podiepolski with this uh, minimalistic uh, design and also anti-utopian. You see the also apartment building uh, inside, uh, it is mirrored, so it gives you uh, the endless reflection, uh, very uh, sort of horror-like uh, 
uh, interior. Then uh, a group of uh, uh, anarchists, uh, uh, architects, uh, they call themselves Arbrev, uh, Michel Abazov, Andrei Chitsov, uh, with this uh, city as an example. Uh, they did a lot of different things. Uh, as an example, uh, this is aquarium city uh, made in watercolor. And uh, Yura Kuzin, uh, with whom I did some number of works, he was sort of my student uh, because I spent about five years uh, at the Institute uh, working there at the Students uh, Architecture and Construction Bureau uh, with his uh, neo-constructivism uh, stuff. Then uh, I started uh, in 86, we started to make an exhibition uh, uh, abroad. The first exhibition abroad was uh, in Dubljana at the Schutz Gallery. And uh, in 87, it was an exhibition uh, in Trinale in Milan. Uh, with this, uh, I designed it as well uh, with this uh, vertical five meters high columns uh, symbolizing Soviet utopias and uh, two horizontal rows is a kind of our fantasies. Um, and uh, then uh, we uh, also accepted uh, a group of uh, Novosibirsk architects. Uh, this is a work of Slava Museum with Tselkovsky Space Museum. And uh, then in 88, we also had an exhibition in uh, Paris. Uh, and it was an exhibition that included uh, works from the architectural museum, uh, like from the 20th century, started from the beginning of, 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 of the 20th century, works of paper architecture, works from Estonia, and works from Novosibirsk. So that was a big joint exhibition there. And in uh, 1990, more or less everything was finished because uh, in 88, somehow we stopped uh, participating in uh, Japan competitions without uh, any influence. We just stopped, uh, probably because Perestroika started. So the all this paper architecture is mostly uh, happened before Perestroika. And in Perestroika, people started to think about, uh, about their own bureaus, uh, how to survive and, 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 and so on. Uh, but uh, there were some people like uh, Sasha Zasimov who continued uh, with his uh, colleges. Uh, he, he's, Actually, he's one of the most paper architects because he continued until, uh, well, until recently uh, he died last year. Um, and uh, the exhibition of paper architecture for, it was in, in, in uh, Frankfurt, then it moved uh, uh, to United States for cities there, for, uh, universities. We, uh, it was Brussels, uh, uh, Fondation for the Architecture. And uh, then there was a big break about 90s. There were only few uh, exhibitions and uh, I uh, came back to paper architecture at the beginning of this century. This is my own exhibition in 2006. And uh, that is exhibition at the State Chetikov Gallery in uh, 2009, there was also exhibition in at the Pushkin Museum in 2015, uh, and uh, I and everywhere uh, we left some 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 of uh, paper works uh, now about 50 works. Uh, 
is at uh, Tretikov Gallery, 30 works at Pushkin Museum, about 100 works uh, at the Russian Museum, and 50 works at the Center of Pompidou uh, four years ago. Uh, that's uh, the story. And after the after, uh, Pushkin Museum exhibition, I started the book. Uh, I had the material, a lot of materials. I have, uh, it was a huge archive. Uh, I used this archive for completing exhibitions uh, here, there. And also I had a lot of slides and a lot of films and a lot of uh, uh, copies. And, uh, and uh, there was a lot of material. And uh, thanks to Cheglakov, Andrei Cheglakov Foundation, uh, I, I, I started to work on the book and I did quite lazily. I spent about three years preparing the book uh, until it came to the uh, Garage Museum and they forced me to finish it and I finished it. And here I'm signing uh, proofs uh, in uh, typography in, in Riga. And uh, that's the book. And uh, it was published first in Russian, then two years later it was republished, reprinted in, in, in English. And this is how it looked like. And then two years ago, the book uh, got the prize from the uh, uh, art newspaper Russia as a book of the year. Uh, this is the story. And uh, I think I'm not too long. This is it. So I'm leaving. I'm leaving. Uh, Great. Thank you. Um, do you want me to? I can. Um, yeah, I know. I see. Yeah. Stop sharing. So this is it. I'm back. To Lovely. Thank you very much. Um, really, that's a huge um, impulse for continuing our conversation. And I know that you just told a small part of this, this enormous story, uh, a larger part of which is told in the book, but, um, but there's still so many, um, so many potential um, questions to ask. So in order to uh, provide some comments and to ask some questions, I, I shall hand over to Anna Bokov, who is an architect, historian and educator, currently faculty member at the Cooper Union and at the City College in New York. Um, and has taught at Parsons, Cornell, Yale, Harvard, and of course the Moscow Architectural Institute uh, too. And she's currently a postdoctoral, well, she's currently a fellow um, at ETH Zurich at the Centre for Advanced Studies in Architecture um, in, um, in Zurich. Uh, and she completed her uh, PhD thesis, uh, uh, well, a couple of years ago or a year ago in Yale, and one of the four years ago. Time flies. That's where I was writing the Facebook post congratulating you on no, no, no. Like two years ago. So already four years ago, but one of the uh, remarkably quickly um, actually because the time passed, the, the time that passes between the completion of theses and the publication of books is often extremely long, um, but not in this case. Uh, and uh, and it's not just any book. It's a pretty, it's a, it's a hefty and beautiful publication. Um, which is, the, yeah, I suppose, much more than the book of the thesis, but uh, the, uh, the the book on the book on Futemas on uh, on the early Soviet, as you could say, avant-garde uh, school of um, school of design, architecture, art, multidisciplinary school of uh, of creation. So we will have, um, well, we'll say more about Anya's book uh, later in November on the. 23rd of November uh, when we launch it. But for now, um, I'll have to <coughs> to Anya to provide a commentary and ask some questions to, um, to Yuri. So over to you. Michal, thank you very much. Uh, and thank you to uh, the PPV, a wonderful platform and Garage uh, for the invitation and Yuri, of course, uh, for this uh, credit, I would say. And, uh, and uh, 
yeah, trust with presenting this very important topic or commenting on this very important topic. So my response is not perhaps in the form of a traditional long form statement, but rather a kind of series of short uh, comments and, and a few questions that actually I've been dying to ask for some time now. So um, I'd like to start with uh, this notion of the curatorial invention. Uh, of course, uh, in order for any movement to happen, somebody has to come up uh, with and sort of pronounce a certain phenomena and movement. And in this case, Yuri is that somebody. And paper architecture is uh, without a doubt uh, your uh, curatorial invention. But your role is also twofold, uh, which is unusual. So you function both inside uh, and outside the movement, uh, both uh, as an artist, uh, you know, an architect, and uh, a curator. And in that way, I would uh, maybe compare you to somebody like Lisitsky, who uh, was both somebody who, of course, contributed greatly to the Russian constructivism, but also somebody who promoted widely uh, in, in, in Europe in particular in the 1920s. And let's say, as opposed to someone like Alfred Barr, who uh, you know, ultimately we can say credit, uh, is credited with uh, the creation of, let's say, modern architecture as a phenomenon with his number of his shows at, the, at MoMA, but of course is not himself. Uh, a protagonist. So in this case, you are uh, absolutely unique. And not only uh, Yuri coined the term, allegedly, of course, like you said, appropriating it from Visnin, uh, who used it in a negative and uh, ironic sense, uh, but you gave it uh, certainly a positive connotation. Uh, you uh, managed competition submissions back in the 80s. You organized exhibitions through the decades. Uh, you created the archive, collected the works, systematized them, treated them as artifacts. And uh, as I said, contributed some of the most recognizable iconic works that are part uh, of the paper architecture movement. So um, I guess my first question, and again, that's not something that has to be answered right away, is uh, at what moment uh, you had the sense that this is something that there is this movement and uh, you know how did you have I would say the patience and commitment to to maintain this for uh, now for decades so that's uh, that's the inaugural one uh, then uh, I want to think about uh, maybe together with uh, with everyone is what makes this a movement right? because uh, you and others uh, talk about this as um, essentially as an umbrella term uh, where the main uh, common thread is that of uh, what uh, we can call unbuilding, right? Or so paper architecture is by definition unbuilt. But in this case, of course, it's never intended to be built. It remains a kind of visual, uh, visual and visionary experiment. Uh, the architects, the young architects were not, you know, supposedly unified in any way. There was no single manifesto, like let's say the futurists. Uh, one of the things that united them uh, was of course this format of ideas competition. So there was literally a format, which uh, typically was one sheet of paper or board uh, with a kind of handmade graphic rendering. And then of course there are also models and we can talk about, about what thought point the models enter in. Uh, and beyond that, there's arguably not much in common, yet of course, there are several things, uh, moments worth pointing out. Uh, and the first one, uh, in my view, is the visual narrative, where architects uh, typically, not that they're silent, but they usually talk within the profession, maybe to their students, to the professional community, but usually not to the public in that way that uh, the paper architects started to speak and communicating using not just the professional language, but using this kind of, uh, let's say, regular or poetic uh, language, the language of artists. And I think that's something what makes it quite, uh, quite unique and quite uh, special, the, this emergence of uh, visual and verbal narrative, where picture and text are interconnected almost uh, maybe like comics, and I wonder if, <laughs> if, if you think that's too much of a stretch. Uh, and the one difference, of course, that there is no, you know, does not unfold in time, it's all at once. So the story has to sort of unfold simultaneously, sorry, instantaneously or simultaneously in one, in one setting. 
the other, uh, I think, notion that unites a lot of the works is this notion uh, of paradox, where in many of this visual narratives, there are certain things that are intrinsically impossible. I don't know, houses without roofs, walls made of glass, bridges that don't connect anything, et cetera, et cetera. And so I think those sort of moments are very, very special and uh, we run into them over and over again uh, with each of the projects, House of Cards, of course. The uh, other idea and, and sort of connected to that is this idea of immateriality and maybe even fragility, which is uh, the, 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 the works carry this, um, pre, uh, this something about them is not permanent, they're temporary, they're, uh, I would say they're theatrical in that sense, and that kind of grows into the next uh, idea of interdisciplinarity, where of course the, there is a common narrative where protagonists don't see much promise uh, within the profession, so they go outside of the profession into the realm of uh, the paper architecture, in other words, not building projects, and experiment uh, you know, using this, this sort of genre, washing out, I would say, the boundaries of architecture. They are inspired by theater, by stage set design, by maybe exhibition design, by temporary installations. So uh, these works are on the boundary, I'll say, I'll, you know, between architecture and all of this other, other fields. And uh, in that sense, uh, even though there are often plans and sections, they are secondary. Rather, it is about uh, this different meanings and states, uh, kind of treating architecture as a novella as a way to tell a story. Um, maybe even like a portrait or a poem in that sense. It's decorative, it's declarative. Um, and the other interesting thing that you mentioned that very well, uh, the, the idea of uh, the school. And in my uh, view, this is really, really critical, very important. The works are not done by a single collective, as, uh, as we know, they are not done in a unified manner, uh, supposedly, yet there is something, I would argue, beyond their belonging to a certain time and place and a certain culture, of course, verbal culture as well, that brings them together. And I would argue that that certain something is the school meaning that the works are, uh, for the most part, produced by um, well, there's actually a variety of schools. So there's, uh, of course, you mentioned the Novosibirsk, Estonia, and many other places. But if we were to talk about, let's say, the uh, Moscow Architecture Institute, Marhi, uh, which uh, in many ways the pedagogy of Marhi is then, I think, also uh, is being, let's say, disseminated or uh, repeated throughout uh, the former Soviet Union, if that's fair to, to say. Uh, the, uh, that pedagogy has a kind of interesting duality about it. And I want to <laughs> ask you about this because I think this is really something that's uh, quite important and is often dismissed and is still very little understood and is um, in fact, the interesting thing about this, it still persists. And that duality has to do with uh, the uh, simultaneous presence of two schools within one school. And that school is, uh, I'm talking about the kind of academic tradition, right? Where there is uh, uh, academic drawing in its most classical sense. There's uh, the study of classical orders uh, that in fact, every student who goes to the school has to uh, immerse themselves in starting even before they enter the school, right? Because there's a series of entrance exams that test your ability to, uh, to draw the head of uh, Caesar, Socrates, uh, uh, Athena, et cetera. Uh, and uh, also uh, in the kind of, you know, the sense that Michelangelo would, would draw. <laughs> And uh, then there is uh, another uh, interesting uh, line uh, that, uh, and that is a line of so-called spatial volumetric composition, a course that is known under the abbreviation OPK, Abiona Prastranstvena Composice. And that uh, ostensibly originates from the avant-garde pedagogy the, uh, and its predecessor, the Marquis predecessor, Futimas. So uh, again, 
uh, it is quite different from the core space that I describe uh, in, uh, in my book on Futumas, but uh, because it actually changes name, it becomes not space, but composition. That's a different story. We can talk about that. Uh, but that inherent duality of education with, uh, I think, produces something very interesting. Of course, it produces this impeccable drawing skill, uh, artistic craftsmanship uh, that is, uh, you know, a, a feature that is, uh, I think, one of the most attractive um, things about paper architecture. But uh, it also uh, produces this, uh, you know, the simultaneity that uh, we see the works in, let's say, Mikhail Belov, right, with, with his kind of dreams, romanticizing the, um, you know, the certain tra traditionalist historical city. And uh, at the same time, we have uh, very avant-garde works like your, uh, your own ones. So how can we uh, reconcile this? Is it, uh, you know, what is this perhaps the one product that is truly uh, a product of this uh, incredibly dualistic educational model. So that's uh, my, I would say, first big question. Uh, and then I have one, two, three, four more, so five questions. <laughs> so the uh, other topic I wanted to uh, discuss is the topic of dissidence. And of course, there is uh, this uh, idea that uh, is commonly referenced, uh, something that unites the work is this idea of dissent. And uh, let's say Ines Weissman describes uh, paper architecture in terms of dissidence in her wonderful essay, Dissidence for Architecture, published uh, among other places, I believe in Europe, the Yale Journal Perspective, which is where I saw it first a few years ago. Uh, that notion of dissidence, of course, presumes that there is a protest against the establishment and the general line, and uh, that protest is addressed towards someone. And there is the unbearable boredom and even hopelessness of the state design institutions uh, that most projects and, and others where everyone with a rare exception was required to work. I believe you work somewhere else <laughs> so in the technical aesthetics uh, uh, in, in magazine. So uh, there were alternatives, but there uh, also seems to be other sides uh, of the establishment. So uh, of course that first one is, is, the, is the school itself. And the question is, you know, then continuing the, the, the discussion on the school, is the school then a cradle of paper architecture or is it the, let's say the citadel of the general line? Is it something what uh, is a subject or an object of protest for, for, the, for the young paper architects? There are also professional press, right? Which we can consider part of the establishment that is official journals such as Arquitectura SSSR, for example, Architecture of the USSR. So in the 1980s, the team was headed by um, Alexander Kudryavtsev, who later became the dean of Moscow Architectural Institute. And I uh, was telling a story right before we started that I uh, found uh, a subscription of the issues of architecture of the USSR just last week uh, in the uh, bookstore. <laughs> uh, and, uh, or maybe it found me. <laughs> but the 1983 um, issue number seven, uh, so exactly the time that you describe uh, features the Crystal Palace competition by Brodsky and Utkin in an essay uh, by uh, Irina Karabina. So the interesting thing to me, so the competition, as you said, was uh, one of the first ones, inaugural ones of the paper architecture in 1982. And in 1983, this magazine that, uh, you know, supposedly uh, transmits the general line uh, includes that in its, you know, kind of a double sided feature. So, uh, you know, maybe the situation a little bit more complex, uh, how come that was possible? What about the technical aesthetics? What about uh, the NITAG, the research institute? So is there kind of an alternative uh, platform or platforms already at that time? So, in related to that, uh, looking at those issues from 1983, one sees that uh, there are also projects that belong to what we uh, now know under the term Soviet modernism that is popularized uh, recently, in fact, by several wonderful publications by Garage, authored by 
Anna Brunavitska and Nikolai Malinin. And then in this case, so, the, and this is an alternative, uh, let's say, set of projects. They're not just standard housing blocks, right, that, that, you, that you showed, but they are much more uh, maybe experimental and, uh, you know, unique. Again, they're, 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 a lot of them are pilot projects, but they're, they're not standardized uh, housing blocks. So what, in your view, is the relationship between deep architecture and this branch or this brand of Soviet modernism. Uh, my last two questions are much shorter uh, and I think uh, they are important. So it seems that, uh, I mean, it is important and, and of course so the, it is important to talk about Soviet architecture in relation to, to the world, right? To the, to the other, to other things that are happening in architecture at the time, uh, other geographies. Of course, the uh, original interest comes uh, or is in a way, uh, inspired by Japan architects. So uh, what uh, was, uh, I guess, what was, you know, not just the reaction of your Japanese colleagues, but uh, what was the relationship perhaps between the paper architecture and what was going on in Japan uh, at the time? Also, I would say that uh, it is uh, interesting to, for me to think about what was, uh, and of course, I think you, you, you obviously knew, everybody knew because the works were published already much earlier uh, of uh, Zaku Hadid, uh, Ram Kulhas, Bernard Chumi, the contemporaries, Western contemporaries who were practicing at the same time, who were interested, uh, as we know quite well, in uh, avant-garde. Uh, there, there are many examples of that. So is there, is there a kind of a connection? Uh, what, uh, what was it? How would you describe it? There are, of course, American architects uh, who were maybe in that same also vein at the time, uh, Lebius Woods, for example, a uh, little bit maybe later, but also their works from the 80s, uh, John Hayduck, uh, Peter Eisenman. And I know they were known uh, in Russia. So, and of course there were also many other experimental collectives there were, that were older Italian ones. Well, I don't know, Super, Super Studio, of course, and Archizum, the, the major one. And uh, finally, I would say the, um, you know, something that we talked about, your work more than others is grounded uh, in references, the avant-garde in the 1920s. Uh, what is your affinity? How did your, you talked about this a little bit, but perhaps maybe you can talk a little bit more about the role of uh, Han Magomedov and, and kind of how this, uh, uh, in particular also maybe the understanding of who to us at the time, if there was one. It's always hard for me to believe that really, really nothing was known. Nobody knew anything. <laughs> and uh, maybe uh, you can comment on, on that. So those are my, my sort of first, first set of questions. <laughs> so. That's it? That's it for now, yes. <laughs> Um, I forgot to do something. I, I, I presented uh, paper architecture, but I didn't present the book itself. So this is a book. I believe it's heavier than your book. And it consists uh, of uh, uh, 376 pages, 570 images, 100 uh, architects uh, presented here and uh, about half a million characters of text. So this is physical presentation, three kilos of weight. Yeah, I forgot. Um, about your questions, uh, from which moment? Um, I think from 1984, there was, there was my first, I would call it curatorial uh, exhibition. Uh, uh, it was just, uh, you know, call each other and uh, ask each other to bring more and uh, to cut the glasses and to hang it on the walls and, and so on. But after some uh, publications, uh, two, three publications, not more, uh, I started to think what's in common, what's in common, what's uh, uh, how to describe what we're doing, because there was already a, a sort of a 
a fund of the project uh, of the projects uh, uh, from uh, 1981 to 1984 not a lot but but you can uh, you can see that those works are sort of urbanistic and those works are sort of on a uh, on the super form and those works are let's say applications uh, to the environment uh, so that there was a kind of i saw some uh, possibility to analyze uh, those projects uh, of course there was uh, kind of i think it was uh, naive analysis uh, at the very first uh, kind of manifesto, which was, we call it the instead of manifesto, which we wrote together with Misha Filipov, uh, that was written only uh, about artists of architecture. So uh, artists' uh, position uh, gave you freedom. And artists' position uh, doesn't move you to certain group uh, like uh, Austin or something like that. Uh, artist position means that everybody should have its own style. And uh, we call it in this, I call it actually, uh, that we are, what we are doing are not projects, but projects of the projects. So there was something uh, that is not uh, supposed to be directly built or realized on the building side but uh, it was something that gave you a mind food uh, uh, to to think about when you get the commission you have to think about it first of what you are going to be to to build uh, for example so that's that's why it's not project but project of the project so they all of course they all could be realized in reality uh, everything that uh, people uh, could have in mind uh, could be built as well. And uh, that was quite important because it, then it gave me a part of freedom. It gave me also a possibility to speak about uh, uh, multiversal uh, utopia. Unlike utopias from the 20s and earlier utopias, it's not the utopia that unite uh participants in uh, some in one city for example but uh this is a lot of uh little facets like a lot of personal utopias and every architects uh every architect uh grew his own utopia and his utopia should be different from the other one utopia and the difference was very important thing uh Mainly, uh, you're right, we are sort of in two groups. One group is sort of modernistic, uh, one group is so classicist, but uh, I don't know, some people like it uh, hot, some people not. Uh, so that's, uh, I think it's very individual. Uh, you see uh, Boris Grigonich Barkhin, a uh, great tutor in our institute. He has students like uh, Brodsky Utkin and Misha Bilov. But uh, you cannot uh, say that they are, uh, have something in common. They are very different, right? So, um, and I, for instance, I think that my teacher was Ilya Lijava, though I was not formally his student. Uh, but Lijava changed the styles of his presentations every time. So, for example, the presentation of Nair in Milan is very different from presentation in Tokyo and from the presentations, uh, the earlier presentations uh, that they had. So that I think that the, the, the language uh, is very different. And I thought that, that the style is not the mean of communication. I, I even, I think it, it's an old uh, thought of mine. I, I thought, well, uh, we have to, we speak by something else, uh, not by style, because the styles are different. But uh, the, probably because one in common thing is, is fairy tales. A lot of those stories are like fairy tales. By the way, uh, art is, is very um, touchy thing. So it's, it's, 
is getting old fashioned very, very soon. The movies are getting old fashioned, the architecture is getting old fashioned. Uh, architecture from the 80s, it doesn't exist anymore because it's, uh, well, I mean, uh, it exists only in uh, residential buildings, but uh, the, the, the buildings uh, that, uh, that uh, form the sort of a basis of uh, Soviet modernist architecture uh, is, uh, is demolished. A, a lot of this architecture is demolished. I, I joke sometimes that, uh, that uh, paper architecture survived in the museums and uh, 500, uh, uh, in 500 years, people think that in the 80s, uh, the architecture was like this in these pictures, not in, in those photos. Uh, and uh, and uh, uh, and artistism uh, is uh, something that uh, made this a uh, movement, as, as, as you ask. Uh, because in the previous projects from the 70s or even 60s, uh, there was no art, there was just architecture. In those uh, uh, utopian, fu futurologistic uh, images of the future city, uh, there was only one figure, uh, figure there, uh, uh, Loktiv, who did different things. And uh, everybody else uh, did more or less the same as Jono Friedman. But, uh, but uh, uh, paper architecture started with uh, art creativity, with the ability to draw, to draw in different techniques and uh, to use different techniques and to think artistically. And this uh, made it uh, a movement from my point of view, of course. And, uh, and uh, we didn't uh, with a series trying to answer me. <laughs> uh, how to how to stop it. Uh, uh, is about, uh, about the uh, dissidents. We didn't think about uh, uh, we are dissidents. Uh, our, let's call them uh, critics, uh, they try to present us as uh, dissidents, as like escapers but uh, not us, uh, ourselves. And I remember uh, I did, uh, I had a lecture at the uh, resort uh, house of uh, architects in Sukhanova uh, before some professionals. And I did show these bright slides uh, with uh, bright projects, paradoxical, and so on. And one of those uh, directors of Moss Project uh, told, uh, told me, what uh, you show is a sort of a sweet cream, but we architects should do black bread. So that, that was the position. But it's not, uh, we, we just did different uh, things. Uh, it was not, we were not on demonstration. I, I, I know if, uh, we, we were not, we didn't feel ourselves partisans, uh, guerrillas. Uh, I, I had a the theory at that time that we should not fight, but we should do the parallel things. If this is the line of Soviet architecture, we, uh, this is our line and uh, it goes like in Lobachevsky, you know, on a parallel way, so we never meet. So there was something like that. And, uh, and uh, about press. About press, it was obvious from uh, this uh, magazine competitions uh, that uh, you should work on a picture that could be uh, printed on a magazine page. So you should think how you be presented in the page. So that give you some more creativity in this, uh, in this way. 
But, uh, you know, вот что мне удалось найти в интернете по запросу «Кретивити МТС». Взгляните. I don't know how to stop it. Uh, She's more active uh, than me. <laughs> yeah, this uh, uh, virtual reality is attacking us. Uh, and, uh, uh, well, lost, <laughs> lost my thought. Uh, the, press on the, page. Uh, the press, yeah. But uh, I should tell you that uh, from 1985, when I started select works and collects, collect works for the exhibition, I started to include to the exhibitions that I curated, not only projects from the competitions, uh, but also projects from like, like engravings of uh, Slava Petrenko, who, who did them in uh, 1980, 81, uh, before we started to take part in the competitions. Or uh, even I included a couple of uh, uh, children drawings uh, from a Start Studio or from uh, a Dust Studio. Or I included some uh, works that were done for, I don't know, for internal competitions or not for competitions. So uh, not only uh, I was not so didactical, so only for competitions and that's, uh, that's it. No, I was trying to, uh, to make it wider and, uh, and, uh, and I, when I had a possibility, I even uh, ordered by myself, uh, for example, uh, we've got some sponsorship money, it was in 88, I think, for the Ah, no, 89, for the exhibition in Frankfurt, I specially ordered uh, 10 models to different uh, members of the, let's call it group, uh, uh, that should be based on their winning projects uh, of the, in the competitions. So uh, I remember Mitya Bush, uh, they did the model based on their winning entry. And I myself uh, did uh, did a model, and uh, for, and Sasha Broski and Yaudki, and they did a sculpture, and uh, Belov and uh, Hazanov they uh, also. So uh, models that appeared there, it was my order actually. Uh, but uh, I I was trying to make it not on, not only on paper but also in three D uh, objects. And uh, so I, I, I trying, I'm, I was trying to make it wider, but uh, as you know, everything stopped in the nineties when the computer uh, renders appeared and uh, everybody started to do more or less the same with the computer because they, they were li limited with the computer programs. So, so this, uh, it was really short. Unfortunately, it was really short event of the last uh, century I mean, the paper architecture, it really uh, took 10 years in the 80s and a little bit uh, in the 90s. So for the book uh, uh, limited by, by, by this time. So nothing that appeared after uh, 2000 uh, year for, is included uh, to the book. So what else uh, I wanted to tell you uh, about the school? I, I told you about the school. Uh, Maybe the, the foreign architects, you know, the kind ah, of foreign architects. You know what you need uh, to know. No, no it, was, it was real lack of information, real lack of information. Uh, uh, of course, we are trying uh, to get some, some, some more information, but uh, it was limited by the number of magazines, by the number of copies, by the number of libraries where uh, you can find it. Uh, of course, we were trying to, to lead, uh, to, well, to follow. I mean, uh, the contemporary architecture. Uh, for example, I changed to, uh, let's say, neoconstructivism when I first time saw the work of uh, uh, Zaha uh, Peak of uh, Hong Kong. Uh, it was printed in so-called Bulletin of, uh, Uni of International Union of Architects. It was this size. The, the, the publication, this size. 
and it was black and white. And I look at it and, and I saw Lisitsky. What am I doing? Why, why am I doing this? Uh, uh, at that time, uh, we were doing an, a competition, UNESCO competition, something like uh, a matryoshka-like uh, uh, capsule, uh, living capsule, something like that. It was very archaic in forms. And uh, we were selected for the second uh, round. And when I saw this little piece of Zaha, I totally changed. So we did, uh, the, the, for the second phase, we didn't uh, totally different. A, a very light, a very transparent, a very like flying uh, Matryoshka, more or less looking like uh, Lisitsky prone uh, in plan. So that was, uh, I was really influenced uh, myself. But uh, Brodsky Utkin, they, they were influenced by Piranesi, and that was in his, in their childhood. They, this is different. And uh, I don't think they, they sought of some of the foreign architects uh, and like uh, uh, contemporary architecture. Uh, I mean, it, it was very individual. Uh, we cannot say that. We all, you know, uh, once a month we meet and uh, and uh, think how whom to follow. Uh, if we meet sometimes, mostly it happened when we uh, bring together works uh, for the uh, next uh, competition and uh, and then we after I move it uh, to the international post office, then uh, with uh, some of my supporters, we, uh, we went for the beer, not, not to, to, to speak about uh, uh, international architecture. Great. Well, I would just, uh, yeah, I, I want to thank you also for mentioning Start and Adas. And uh, full disclosure, I'm a former student of both of those studios. And uh, in particular, Adas was hugely influential. And I actually uh, remember the summer of 88 as a child uh, and painting all summer long uh, a work that went into the catalog uh, that uh, was possible thanks to you and uh, had an enormous influence I think, on my entire uh, life up until now. So that is a different person. He's a different person. He's a student of Lejava. And uh, for, for, for Lejava's generation and Gutnov's generation, the information was uh, number, num number one in their program. So they, they and there was a, a group uh, that, uh, uh, that have got together to gather information. So that, that was the, the first thing for them, but uh, not for us. So maybe we should open the discussion to the audience and we have some great experts um, in the audience and talk. I think that, I mean, this would, I would be, uh, I, I think it would be fantastic if, if this dialogue could go on forever. And Anya, you prepared some brilliant questions that were both directly responding to what Yuri was saying, but also were, are, are very much informed by your own um, experiences. Evan, I have 5,000 other questions, and I think we, we can like really watch, we can watch the recording of this conversation and, and, and think of further questions to animate our conversations for, um, for years to come. Um, uh, so that was great. Thank you very much both for, for, for that exchange. And there are several questions already from the audience. So in the spirit of, of not um, embracing the vertical velocity, but trying to pervert it a little bit, we should probably uh, we should probably open up the questions both to those people in the audience who've already said something, but maybe to Andres and to, and to uh, Marcus here. I can see he already has a question uh, who, who haven't yet um, um, had an opportunity to speak. Officially, we're supposed to finish at half past. Um, so in six minutes, but I'm very happy to stick around for a bit longer. And if Anya and Yuri and anybody else wants to carry on speaking after the official end time, then, then, then I'm sure that would be that would be enjoyed by all. So I wonder whether perhaps Gleb and Anya, maybe we take three questions at a time, whether Gleb and Anya and Marcus want to ask their questions out loud. Uh, Gleb, are you there?
maybe oh yes yes, you are. yes. hello hello hi i'm glad hi. i'm sorry i'm on my way uh, on the street so uh, i will try to make it really quick so my question is uh, whether yuri or anna thinking about uh, the influence of uh, of paper architecture movement on uh, today's uh, architectural practices uh, in Russia or worldwide, um, and if 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 they think that uh, there is such an influence, so that was the question. Thank you. Thank you. So we'll take that. That's a very obviously uh, good question, and we'll take that together with a couple of others because uh, there are so many. So Anya Ivakovich Martini, so you still there, or I can read out your question. Yes. Uh, hello, yeah, I'm there. Um, well, the question is just quick. Um, Anya mentioned a potential similarity between uh, paper architecture and comics because of the narrativity, and I was really interested in, in if someone could elaborate this a bit more or maybe even give some examples. That's it, thank hey. you. Thank you, that's, that's also great. And Marcus, are you there? Uh, yes, hello. Yeah, sorry, I'm also on my phone because I was walking when it began. But thank you, first of all, Yuri and Anna and, and Michal. Uh, I, I have I have two two quick questions. One, one of them was uh, is was related to you spoke a lot about the the school and uh, the centrality of Moscow through your own perspective. But I, I'm I'm also interested in this that there were quite a few people from from all across uh, the Soviet Union. So. What was the very practical uh, means of, of communication? Did you was there communication between you, Yuri, and uh, the people in Novosibirsk and Lenin, Leningrad and elsewhere? And if there was, what was the nature of it? And then the second question relates to this. You mentioned in this uh, Yuri in this last comment this moment of uh, uh, of taking the uh, the works to the international post office, and I've heard some descriptions also of this that. That like that you would come together and look at everyone's work and then then take it. Like, could could you could you give a description of this? And and also you, you meant, also you mentioned uh, very briefly that there was some minor ideological uh, 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 from the Union of Architects that they they did that, that, that there was some censorship. Did they did they take away some works or or not? And how how did that work? Just in very practical terms. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Marcus. And for anyone who doesn't uh, know Marcus's work, Marcus has uh, curated a number of exhibitions and published a number of excellent publications focusing on, well, particularly on, on Sasha Brodsky's uh, work. So check them out. Um, so may I, I may I answer? Otherwise, uh, I'll forget yes, about it. Yes. Mm -hmm. uh, about comics. Uh, we we well in the eighties we we don't have uh, such uh, kind of a we didn't know more about uh, comics culture, but uh, you know the the stripes uh, is also used uh, in the uh, in the movies uh, the movie directors uh, quite often they did the uh, the scenes uh, one by one so. I think uh, this comics-like uh, culture uh, better work with uh, with the movies uh, stripes. I don't know how to call them uh, professionally. Uh, and we know that uh, Eisenstein did these stripes, and uh, so 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 uh, so on. Uh, then about the um, about the influence, uh, I think there is an influence. It's a bad influence, actually. Uh, so. For, uh, especially in this uh, so-called blagoustroistva, in this uh, urban uh, design. So some, some places have got their bright names, uh, some, but, uh, but unfortunately it's, it's quite uh, empty. So there is like bubbles uh, that only have the form of, uh, of it, but doesn't have its uh, uh, content. Uh, uh, when I when I see uh, like paper architecture uh, in uh, uh, computer renders, uh, so I think it's 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 a bad way of for paper architecture to be presented like this. And then the uh, uh, the technique of how did we send uh, projects abroad? 
First of all, I was uh, injected to the Union of uh, Architects, not as a member of Union. I became a member of Union in 1985. It's another story quite earlier. Uh, but uh, uh, as so-called Young Architects uh, section, it was something like that. And I was uh, responsible for competitions for young architects. Uh, and uh, uh, how did it look? Every month I have uh, I had so-called comp competition review, and it was a monthly review in the House of Architects. Uh, I prepare some program in slides for for everybody, everybody who, who uh, could come and and and, and see it. And I uh, talked about some competitions in the past and sometimes presented the winners of that uh, competitions. Uh, and uh, they commented their works uh, publicly. And also if I had uh, the future competitions programs, I uh, trying with the help of my friends to translate them into Russian and to copy them and to spray them in auditorium. So there was a sort of a propaganda work from, from my side. And uh, when uh, the deadline, uh, in the deadline, everybody came, participants came to the Union of Architects, to the House of Architects with their entries in one or two uh, sheets of paper uh, one sheet of paper was for glass competitions and two for residential competitions. Uh, it's it's uh, Japan Architect uh, created this. And five rubles. And uh, all these uh, projects uh, cover the floor in rows. And uh, when everything was done, the group of uh, kind of a committee from the secretaries of the union came about five seven uh, and they went through the past uh, these lines and they saw it and sometimes stopped and asked what is this and i was only person in auditorium because uh, everybody else were kicked from uh, from uh, from the main hall of the of um, of the house, and uh, sometimes I was lucky uh, because, uh, for example, uh, Misha Bilov and I we did a project for the competition called uh, Museum of Sculpture, and we did the uh, vertical columbarium. So the, the skyscraper is, is Columbarium and it grows endlessly and uh, it occupied a very little space uh, in, in, in the city. And on top of it, there was a crane in the form of a cross, red cross. And it built and built and built and, and, and the skyscraper grows together with, with, a, with a cross. And it was, uh, it was is, is very, uh, black and white uh, graphics uh, with black figures of plants and uh, facades were also black with uh, white lines inside. Uh, and one of those uh, secretaries asked, what is this? Is it a kind of a black humor that we're going to send from the Soviet Union? Well, it, it sounded like that. And luckily I was uh, standing nearby and I said, no, it's anti-American project. And, and they said, ah, okay. So that, that, they, they were ready to stop this project, but uh, good joke uh, saved the, 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 the situation. Uh, there was another story with the project of Misha Filipov that I did show you uh, his uh, uh, watercolor, uh, city uh, for the year 2001. Uh, they came, this group of secretaries, they came from uh, somebody's funeral. Uh, they were not uh, in a good shape uh, themselves. Uh, they stopped by uh, 
a missions project and they realize there is some uh, kind of church uh, in his drawing and uh, not only the church but the church was with with golden crosses on on the top of the cupolas and they said well in soviet union uh, the church uh, has to be uh, different from uh, uh, from the state so we cannot send this project and uh, and I myself, uh, after we sent the the big bench of project uh, through the international post office, uh, next day I came to the secretary secretary of uh, ideology. Uh, there was a special position in our union, Rebushin, asking him to give his personal. Uh, permission to send this project. And I, I, I told him like, oh, look, it's beautiful. It's uh, clever done. It's uh, beautifully drawn and, and so on and so on. And I said, okay, so on my permission. And uh, so I sent this, uh, this project and we both uh, have got uh, prizes and the same competition. Uh, but after, after the committee, and I actually I didn't remember other uh, sort of uh, censorship. One, but not for the good project. Uh, it was not beautifully uh, drawn, actually. Uh, so it was really mild uh, censorship. And uh, and after that, uh, we put the project three or four pages uh, to one uh, tube. A standard tube that we bought at the uh, Children's World uh, shop uh, and uh, brought it to the International Post Office. And uh, this tube uh, to send it cost like 13 rubles, uh, 47 copics, uh, and so like on. A $1,000 so today. <laughs> 13 rubles? No, something like that. Anyway. Um, no. Ah, well, you mean uh, by that price? Yeah. Uh, well, I guess uh, salary. It's a, it's a so usually the 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 rest of uh, between uh, the 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 sum that was given to us by participants and the real price for uh, from the international post office, there were like about ten rubles, for example. So with a group of people, I I. Uh, drive to to uh, to the bar and spend it there so that that's the technique you can understand one one thing and i know we have to we have two wonderful questions that i'm actually dying to hear uh, as well uh about practice i think it's important to note uh that ah. many oh. of paper architects um Brodsky, Utkin, Savin, Bush, uh, uh, in fact, are practicing happily today and have been practicing for the last uh, couple of decades, if not more. So since the time uh, when they were paper architects, they since then became the real architects. So I think there is a very oh, direct connection yeah. for a while. For, yeah, there, for yeah, there are two, yeah, yeah, there are two questions. The, the first question is how we managed to do it uh, after the main job uh, that we had. So after the main job, uh, people came uh, back to uh, their homes and uh, in the kitchen or, or somewhere else, uh, two, three people uh, sit together on one uh, sheet of paper and draw together and, and so on. Uh, I had a theory why, why uh, there are a lot of groups uh, in the paper architecture, two, three uh, persons. Uh, I think it was because of talks. Uh, so it was uh, it was much more comfortable to talk to each other while doing some uh, common work together. Uh, but uh, Sasha Brodsky had a beautiful uh, father's uh, studio with. Uh, uh, engraving machine, uh, so that's why they started to use O4 uh, technique uh, quite uh, soon, when they realized that uh, if you send uh, entry abroad, uh, it didn't uh, get back, and uh, so this printing technique uh, helped us to uh, 
uh, to keep uh, this archive of uh, works uh, and um, some well somebody just uh, stayed uh, longer in their offices uh, differently but uh, mainly it was uh, a part of the main job and how they are now most of them are working, most of them quite successful, like Tatan Kuzimbaev is very successful in uh, wooden uh, buildings. Uh, and uh, Savit and Labazov uh, works work together. For, sometimes you can see the a kind of a style uh, uh, close to what they did uh, in the 80s and 90s, uh, sometimes it's uh, just a work. Like for Mitya Bush, uh, who is uh, designing uh, stadiums for football stadiums uh, for last uh, football championship, for example. Uh, but uh, he spent two years uh, Recently, he spent two years and redraw all the works that they did together in the 80s. About 20 works he did himself, just sitting and doing it uh, manually. Uh, it's, it's, a, it's a something unbelievable. I, <laughs> nobody of us cannot imagine that, that this is possible. So he has, now he has the full set of, uh, uh, their works of, 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 of the 80s uh, that he repeated by himself. More or less the same like he did it. And he didn't use the uh, photocopy technique at all. He just uh, from the stretch uh, started uh, uh, to build the, the project uh, like it was in the 80s. This is like Rolling Stones uh, <laughs> day. It's amazing. <laughs> All right. Oksana and Andres have been waiting very patiently with their, with their excellent questions. So I'll, I'll hand over to them now to ask uh, to make their points. If that's okay, Oksana. Right. Yes, well, th thank you very much. Uh, actually, both of my questions uh, have been answered uh, just. So uh, I, think, I think Yuri Avakomov read and, and answered my first question and the second question, well, it, it was asked, it wasn't answered yet, but it's on the intra-Soviet exchange, because um, what happened inside of the Soviet Union, how much exchange did, 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 did you have with other areas in Russia or with other republics like with Stalin paper architect? And one small notice, as far as I'm informed, uh, a paper architect from Novosibirsk, Andrei Chernov, is kind of the de papers, his architecture from the 80s, and he builds in real the unrealized projects that he, he has drawn uh, as, a, as an architect, as a Soviet architect during the 80s. Yeah, just small notice. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, yeah, about the contacts. Um, well, uh, of course, uh, I know some architects uh, from Estonia, uh, but only because uh, I was lucky to visit Estonia and uh, I was in good hands there and I met all the main uh, architects there. And uh, I, uh, well, I still uh, keep some uh, contacts uh, with a uh, few of them. Mm, uh, that, that, that was just on the, uh, I don't know, uh, it was just pleasure to, to know such people. Uh, and uh, the same with uh, Novosibirsk uh, because uh, uh, Slava Mizin and uh, uh, Andrei Kuznetsov, it was in uh, what, uh, 83, they came uh, to Moscow for uh, Stajarovka in, uh, uh, in uh, one of the Moscow offices, uh, architectural offices. So they spent some time in Moscow 
uh, and uh, they realized that uh, there is something interesting in Moscow, like those competitions, and they started uh, do these competitions in Novosibirsk, send them to Moscow, and from Moscow, they were sent to Tokyo. So, so the uh, I, I can imagine this flight to Tokyo that uh, fly uh, over in uh, Novosibirsk. <laughs> uh, that 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 was a, a, a sort of absurdic bureaucracy that uh, instead of sending from Novosibirsk directly to Tokyo five hours, they have to send their project four hours to Moscow and then uh, 10 hours from Moscow to, to Tokyo. That, that was stupid. But we, more or less, we know each other. And, um, and plus, I was in, in, in charge of, uh, of uh, uh, collecting, selecting, sending projects and so on. So, so, uh, so they, they should know me anyway. Um, yeah, we know each other. It was not, uh, we didn't have WhatsApp and, 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 and Zoom and, and so on. So that, that was not easy, uh, no mobile uh, connection. But uh, we, we know each other since that time. And uh, uh, Novosibirsk uh, architecture should be, uh, should be a special edition uh, for Novosibirsk architecture or paper architecture. Uh, and it, it should be published uh, in November. And uh, I wrote uh, an article to, um, uh, to this, uh, I don't know, book. Let's call it book. So also by Park Books, I believe. Sorry. It's mm -hmm. by... Thank you, publish, publish yes. you published. Yes. Uh, uh -huh. Yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm dying to hear Andres' question. Andres is one of the... Surely the one of the most widely, or perhaps the most widely published commentator and historian of paper architecture in, in existence. So uh, uh, please go ahead. And, uh, yeah. <laughs> thank you, you're putting a lot of pressure. But um, I thank you both for this talk and uh, interesting comments. And Yuri, uh, also the timeline. I never, I, we, we, we talk with Yuri a lot about paper architecture, but uh, I've never heard about his. Uh, personal timeline in this form. So this is very interesting to hear. But I want to go back maybe to this name. And uh, one of the things that first uh, uh, struck me when I, when I met you, you showed me the poster of the 1984 um, exhibition, or it was really the booklet, uh, the, like, which you did yourself. And you haven't uh, shown this very often, but, but it's, it's published there in the book. And um, and you explained that actually uh, the name paper architecture partly derived from that moment when you were doing this poster that it has this kind of DIY uh, instructions that you can cut it out and do your own paper architecture or something along the line. So maybe you could explain explain this because in a way it, it gives a very it gives a little bit different angle to this. To this name, it has a more maybe participatory or even activist angle to it. I know oh. that we probably wouldn't use the word activist. Yeah, the, yeah, there was uh, of course uh, uh, sometimes chance uh, played a great role in 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 paper architecture. Uh, we uh, when we as a group we started. Uh, uh, we had a couple of meetings uh, discussing uh, what should be the name of the exhibition. Uh, we didn't have uh, any of us uh, had a, experience uh, to take part in the exhibitions. And, uh, and, and names were very stupid, like uh, man, uh, earth, and cosmos, something like that. Uh, so <laughs> so we, we didn't know from where uh, should we take a normal name to, to the exhibition because all exhibitions uh, uh, that we were surrounded, they were like uh, very uh, ideological, they had very ideological names, like youth of, uh, uh, of the country or some, something like that. But at the same time, I, was, I started to think about what we're doing uh, already. 
And I had some number of uh, possible names like uh, paper architecture, because I heard this expression uh, in the Institute or uh, easel architecture, because I heard this expression uh, at the studio of my uncle, an artist, or uh, uh, I don't know, ouvrage, if uh, there is such a word in English, uh, architecture, uh, like uh, like uh, it's, a, it's a name for uh, some of uh, Piranesian uh, Vidutas. Uh, so I thought, well, we just started the uh, doing an exhibitions uh, and uh, we do this exhibition uh, in youth magazine the next exhibition will be somewhere else and so on so uh, i start so my actually i had three utopian thoughts uh, in my curatorial practice let's call it uh, first thought was how to make it possible uh, to everyone uh, without union of architects go straight to the post office and send his uh, project to Japan personally. In, in the Soviet Union, it sounded absolutely utopian. Uh, but this, this happened uh, when the Soviet Union uh, was demolished. The second thought, when more or less we uh, we started to, well, well, this process of sending uh, projects everywhere uh, was sort of uh, technically uh, organized. Then the next thought that we architects uh, uh, quite often behave uh, not as artists and uh, uh, I, we should uh, think artistically and we should uh, take part in the uh, exhibitions uh, together with architects or with artists and uh, and we really started to uh, it was it was really started this line as well and uh, the third idea was about museums but i thought it's it's the, the museums are so so far away but finally and uh, this thought uh, also uh, uh, I realized that, that uh, I, I, I made it real for myself. So, so when the chief uh, artist from the youth magazine called me and said that we had just last night to, to, to present the, the brochure, the folder, I called to Andrei Savin and uh, he came to me. We had night before, we had some a uh, list of works of each uh, participant. And we started to use the normal technique for this time. Uh, in the 80s, uh, we didn't have computers. Uh, the technique was called clay uh, nojnice, so scissors and glue. So you, you cut the, the, the pieces of paper, you glue uh, on a, well, you did the layout. It was a normal way to make a lay layouts uh, in, in, in this time. And while we were doing this, uh, uh, and uh, I also thought uh, how this folder could be cut into little, let's say, tickets for every participant, uh, it was kind of automatically, uh, I use the name paper architecture from this list of possible uh, titles. And uh, that's how it happened. Thanks, many thanks. Yeah, but I, I, I didn't think uh, that it would be one and forever, the last one and forever title, but it so happened that uh, it became popular immediately. Thank you, everyone. I think, and I mean, unless there's any closing thoughts, we're we're probably all. Um, this is a good. It's a good triumphant moment to, to finish the discussion. So, um, the, but fear not. The the movie of the conversation will be available to watch on um, on the CC YouTube channel and on the PPV site soon. So, um, I want to thank everyone very much for uh, for these absolutely fantastic contributions. You only for the for the sort of magisterial. 
uh, presentation and, and really I think new insights were delivered to, to everyone here and to, into the history of the of the movement and into your own role in it by your presentation and Anya by your absolutely mind-boggling um, wide-ranging series of questions of course not all of which were answered but many of which were and everyone else Marcus Andres and, and uh, Oksana for, for these great questions um, and uh, keep uh, coming to the PPV site uh, our next event is about um, uh, the commons post-socialist commons what happened to common space and public space after the fall of socialism, I was actually just looking through your uh, through the album, and I noticed um, uh, Vladimir uh, Turin's uh, works. Right from nineteen, which year were they from? 1990 or nineteen eighty eight? The uh, post post socialist post socialist Ah, the, yeah, 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 eighty eight, I think, yeah. 88. Yeah. And what is actually the what is the original Russian? What is it? Post-Soviet Republic, or does it have a different? Yeah, the, the, yeah, the, that's the correct name. Is so we we didn't really rename it. So okay. that, that, that. I, actually, he uh, he used to live in Leninsky Prospect, and he saw this landscape from his uh, window, uh, more or less. So he just uh, you right. know a little bit visit. <laughs> I wasn't sure if that was a vision. This is exactly that, that would have been my question had I had time to ask it. And in, in, in fact, I did. Whether that was a vision of the future or a vision of the present or a vision of the future in the present. Uh, <laughs> well, unfortunately, he died uh, 13 years ago. So we Every should ask you. Well, well, one day we will. Um, <laughs> But thank you, everyone, again. Um, so, our, so our next event is about the post-socialist city and the, and the kind of what happened to the common space uh, in the post-socialist city. The event after that is with um, Jesse Weaver Shipley, um, who's a professor of anthropology um, in Dartmouth um, College, and it's about the aesthetics of revolution and coup d'état in Ghana, and in particular, it's about the aesthetics of the Jerry Rowling's coup um, in, in Ghana in the 1970s. And then finally, on November the 23rd, we have uh, the launch for Anya's Kutemas uh, book with Ines Weizmann as, um, as the uh, commentator. So thanks very much, everyone, again, to all the audience for participating. And uh, yes, I can't wait to continue these uh, conversations in person one day, one day soon, somewhere one day soon. OK, thank you, Michal. Thank you, Anya, for your questions. And thank you all for listening. Thank you very much. Bye. Bye.